Yeah, right? Yeah. Our last speaker in this session will be Professor Jonathan Milgram from the Jewish Theological Seminary speaking about teaching Talmud, the oral and written through the ages and in today's classroom. So I guess that's like the whole conference. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, uh, this lecture is taken from some work that I did recently as a fellow at Brandeis, uh, where they gathered uh, Talmud professors from different universities to discuss methods in teaching, and they gave me the task of uh, developing oral recitation in class. And so um, I wrote this, and I hope that it will stimulate the discussion. The title is slightly different, now it's called Talmud in the Mouth, Oral Recitation and Repetition Through the Ages and in Today's Classroom. Introduction. Scholars recognize the role of oral recitation and repetition in the production, publication, and dissemination of rabbinic literature from the Mishnaic to the Gaonic period. The part played by oral recitation and repetition in educational settings in centuries past, however, was of lesser concern. And certainly the imitation of ancient and medieval models of recitation and repetition in the context of the contemporary classrooms was basically entirely ignored. The goal of this lecture is to chart some of the presumed functions of oral recitation and repetition <coughs> in Tanhidic and Maritic in the only educational context, and using testimony from student evaluations, discuss the benefits reaped from the integration of age-old study models into my contemporary college classroom. My undergraduate class, called uh, Sugyot about Sukkot, taught at the Albert A. List College of Jewish Studies, the Jewish Studies College of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, was conducted through a method of oral rec recitation and repetition similar to what is known in some contemporary educational contexts as choral reading. I only found that out after I had already done this. So I learned a lot after uh, intuiting what to do. I read the Talmudic discussion, or Sukya, out loud, line by line, and the entire class repeated after me in unison. The regular incorporation of this exercise in my class sessions was meant, in part, to simulate the oration of texts assumed by scholars to have taken place during the time of Amoraic, and even Gaonic periods, a matter I will address in more detail below. Certainly, there is an inherent anachronism in my imitation of ancient and medieval exercises in the context of the contemporary classroom under the guise of somehow approximating what the Talmudic sages and their textual inheritors, the Geonim, practiced. Unquestionably, we cannot reproduce in any real sense whatever took place in those classrooms in the academies of yore, since we know so little about the activities that happened in those educational settings and our own pedagogic framework is so dramatically different. Unfortunately, the historical truths will be forever concealed from us. We can, however, play, experiment with the imitation of assumed practices, especially when we can appreciate the benefits of these methods for our students' education. For simulation can result in stimulation. Below, first I explore some aspects of oral recitation and repetition in the educational context of the Tanaim and Amoraim and the later Gionim. Following, I introduce my college course and the goals I set out. Finally, I discuss why I think that the incorporation of the methods outlined enhanced my students' educational experience, enabled the accomplishment of the academic goals, and even solidified the students' appreciation of Talmudic literature. Oral recitation and repetition through the ages. Saul Lieberman, in his seminal study of the publication of the Mishnah, argues that the Mishnah was never published in writing, only orally, and also suggests how the Mishnah was disseminated orally in antiquity. In one instance, worth citing here, he entertains the possible role of orality in the educational context of the Tanaim. When the master taught his disciples, quote, he taught the new Mishnah to the first Tana, afterwards he taught it to the second Tana, then to the third, after the Tanaim knew it thoroughly by heart, they repeated it in the college in the presence of the master, who supervised its recitation, corrected it, and gave it its final form. Lieberman hypothesizes that the educational function of oral recitation and repetition was to internalize the text by committing it to memory, and later to correct it, leading to the official and authoritative version. 
Jakob Elman's recent claim for a pervasive orality, Talmudic Babylonia, presents a compelling corollary to Lieberman's conception regarding the earlier Talmudic period. Elman asserts that the legal material found in the Babylonian Talmud was orally transmitted, that the last layer, made up of dialectical and redactional elements known as Stama Talmud, was also orally composed. As Elman correctly notes, a shift took place between the time of the production of the Babylonian Talmud's latest layers and the age of the Gionim. I quote, in the Gaonic period, oral transmission of the Babylonian Talmud was a conscious choice, given the prevalence of book culture in Islamic Iraq, end quote. Indeed, in this period, an age during which oral recitation and repetition of Talmudic literature remained predominant and privileged, technologies for publishing handwritten books were prevalent. And despite the existence of, pu of book publishing, the method seemingly did not impact the study of Talmud among the Gaonim. So we are to understand from the 10th century eyewitness account of Rabbi Nathan Nathan Ababli, who chronicled his visit to the Gaonic <coughs> Academies, describing the educational setting in which the orally transmitted text of the Babylonian Talmud was studied. He writes, and when the head of the academy wants to examine them concerning the, their study text, the Yisab, they gather around him in the four Sabbaths of the month of Adar, and he sits, and the first row recites before him, and the other rows silently, and he reads, and they are silent. So now I see silence differently than I did uh, before, which is why we all come together for these events. The description here is of a repetition exercise during which the students recite to the master the text they learn, and the master subsequently recited his version of the text. The central role of oral recitation and repetition in the Tanaitic, Amoraic, and Kaonic periods is clear. What remains to be examined are the possible benefits, if any, of the imitation and integration of said methods into the contemporary college classroom, the potential pedagogic gains provided by oral repetition and recitation will, in the end, define the new role of this methodology in the next stage of its historical implementation. It's my hope that my undergraduate course, Sukkot about Sukkot, marks the humble beginnings of that next phase, the course and its goals. The class I taught, Sukkot about Sukkot, was an undergraduate course designed for intermediate level students. The material covered consisted of selected discussions, Sukkot, Sukkot from the Babylonian Talmud tractate Sukkot. Relating to the holiday of Sukkot, the topics covered in these Sukkot were the physical dimensions of the Sukkot, how many meals one is obligated to eat, the required attributes of the lulav and the I don't know if I tell you what that is, the conditional gifting uh, um, the conditional gifting of a lulav to another for ritual use in expectation of its eventual return, uh, <coughs> the legality of using a stolen lulav on the first day of the holiday, lulav v'gazul. The class met twice weekly for one hour and 15 minutes. Of the nine students in the class, eight were graduates of Jewish high schools and had previous exposure to rabbinic texts in the original. Certainly, none of the students had previously been taught through any method of oral recitation and repetition. At most, some had been called on individually to read from texts out loud in the context of their high school Talmud classes. The primary course goal was that, was that by the end of the semester, students would be able to decode the text of the Babylonian Talmud in the original Hebrew and Aramaic. Decoding, as I saw it in the context of this course and other courses I teach, entailed the students knowing the meaning of every word in the sukya, that's a Talmudic argument, uh, reading the words in the original languages fluently, pronouncing them accurately, and, of course, comprehension, that is, understanding the use of technical terminology and following the flow of the logical argument presented in the text. Repetition and recitation in the context of the contemporary college classroom. During the course of the semester, at each class session, I recited the text of the sugya line by line, and students repeated verbatim. My recitation included enunciation and inflection, emphasis on the proper pronunciation of each word in the text, and a stress on the technical role of each statement in the sugya. Accordingly, students would immediately realize whether the statement read was a question versus an answer, whether a dictum was simply stating something, or a statement aggressively defending a position, and whether a proof was rebutted or upheld. In the contemporary classroom, my students and I simulated to a certain degree 
the drills described by Lieberman for Talmudic educational methods and similar exercises likely carried out in Talmudic Babylonia in its context of pervasive morality, and the Gaonic practice uh, described in the eyewitness account of Nantana Babu. When engaging the text through oral recitation and repetition, my impression was that the students internalized elements of the material and owned the text in a qualitatively different way than if they had just read the text out loud as individuals and had me guide their reading in its rhetorical qualities. The group performance and repetition after my recitation provided a different experience with a positive outcome. Indeed, the other side of Walter Ong's observation that, quote, writing separates the knower from the known and thus sets up conditions for objectivity in the sense of personal disengagement or distancing, end quote, is that oral performance provides for the opposite, a cognitive closeness, an unparalleled internalization of the text recited. As affirmed by student G, since they remain anonymous in this, uh, he or she wrote, quote, one of the things I love most about Talmud is the sound, or the nigun, nigun for you, Eitan, which the learning brings, the moving sound that comes out of the reading of the text. Hearing or imagining the tone of voice that the rabbis used and repeating it out loud multiple times helps me to understand the argument of the text. Given my processing, this kind of learning helped me to better internalize the text." End quote. For some, the experience of oral recitation and repetition helped with what we might term fluency and grammatical accuracy when reading. It also provided a sense of appreciation of the Talmud's literary and intellectual program and as a result, a connection with some broader ideal of Talmud study. As student A observed, for me, my mistakes in punctuating the Talmud text prevent me from fully grasping the dynamics of the dialogue. Reading aloud in class helped me with punctuation and therefore also intonation. But even more than this practical matter, I think that reading the text aloud highlights the very nature of the Talmud and by extension, Talmud study. Indeed, this student's comments relate well to the findings of some educators regarding the benefits of oral recitation and repetition of poetry and short stories in the classroom, including matters mechanical, such as better diction and fluency. The student's evaluation also expresses an increased general appreciation for the literature study, a benefit of oral repetition and recitation documented by some reading specialists. Student C emphasizes a different enhancement, provided by the oral exercises, comprehension. Quote, I think that I also had a better comprehension of what the sugya meant, because I could understand how individual words were emphasized within their sentences. So when we spoke with certain emphasis of one word or the other, I could follow and comprehend the sentence itself better, end quote. Yet another skill reading teachers note students acquire through the practice of oral recitation and repetition. The effects of the pedagogic paradigm of oral recitation and repetition on retention of material by students of English as a second language are duly discussed by Joyce K. and Daniel S. McCauley in their study, Using Choral Reading to Promote Language Learning for ESL Students. I draw here specifically from the study by McCauley and McCauley, I assume they're related, on students of English as a second language, because the challenges confronted by the population, this population are, at times, similar to those encountered by my students at Talmud, for whom Hebrew and Aramaic are certainly secondary languages. The study by Macaulay and Macaulay focuses on the application of the pedagogic practice known as choral reading, described by the authors in accordance with M. H. Arbuthnot's definition as, quote, the oral reading of poetry that makes use of various voice combinations in contrast, to create meaning or highlight the tonal qualities of the passage, end quote. It goes without saying that a dialectical literature, such as the Talmud, composed and transmitted orally over generations, is expressed better when read out loud. But more than just about oral recitation, choral reading is also about repetition, and it is this significant act that promotes the progress charted by reading teachers. As documented in Macaulay and Macaulay's article, reading specialists discussed the benefits of oral recitation and repetition for over 100 years, starting with the now classic study by Edmund Burke Huey, The Psychology and Pedagogy of Reading. 
More recently, Peter A. Schreiber emphasized that repeated reading enhances the student's ability to, quote, recognize what kind of syntactic phrasing is necessary to make sense of the passage, end quote. Other reading specialists stress improved self-confidence and a sense of empowerment as a result of choral reading strategies. And, at least according to student C, this was also a byproduct of my course. Overall, reciting the text orally was empowering because it allowed me to understand the language used by the sudhya. More than just summarizing the research on choral reading, though, Macaulay and Macaulay argue for the benefits specific to students of English as a second language. In that setting, according to the authors, choral reading is successful in part because it is a low anxiety activity. All children, they, this is quoting the article, all children can and do participate. There's no failure, no tension. The children are safe. Their individual mispronunciations are absorbed by the overriding voices of the group. Even children with the least facility in English can experience fluent reading. For Macaulay and Macaulay, fluency is achieved in the group setting because of the creation of a safe space. My students affirm the safe space. An enjoyable context of oral recitation and repetition in my classroom, plainly stating, <laughs> this is funny to me, sorry, quote, this is a cool thing to experience, end quote. <laughs> and, because I don't think of myself as very cool, and quote, it was actually pretty fun to read together, Conclusions. The implementation of oral recitation and repetition, age-old methods for the study of rabbinic texts in my college Talmud classes yielded positive results. As evidenced by the students' comments, the methods enabled the accomplishment of the course goals I set out for my students. Furthermore, the oral recitation and repetition was enjoyable and solidified the student's appreciation of Talmudic literature. The classroom recitation and repetition provided the template for the oral performances of the text the students did for me privately and individually in my office for their exams. During the exams, the, student applied, the students applied what they learned and were pushed to reproduce what had been done in class at this time as individuals and not as members of the group. Certainly, for some students, the exam experience was not stress-free. To be sure, for some, the inability to rely on the group for support made the experience extra challenging. Student C commented on this issue specifically. I think that it would have been useful to do individual readings during class time so that we could each practice the sugya with our own voice. Though I still think that reading the text orally together did help me with the oral. All in all, the students performed exceptionally well. One student actually read perfectly and understood not a word of what he said. <laughs> and then it all made sense, you know, to what I had studied so many years ago about the Tanaim reciting. <laughs> he read perfectly and had no idea what he was saying. All in all, the students performed exceptionally well. Student G even attributed success during the, the exam to the group recitation and repetition experience. Quote, because our exams were oral, which I most prefer and find that I learned most from, it was especially helpful to read out loud as a class and repeat multiple times the text in front of us that we were later to be tested on. The educational outcomes of oral recitation and repetition in my class, Yota Datsuko, matched in meaningful ways the results researched by advocates of oral reading. The implementation of the strategies I described provided a positive educational experience for my students and significantly improved their Talmud text reading skills. Really, from down here all the way up here, they, they improved so much. It is my hope that others, too, will benefit from the integration of oral recitation and repetition in their Talmud classes.